Ready? Right. Okay, thank you for coming. This is the second talk for this session. Uh, should be a lot easier talk, I think. <laughs> Not so difficult. But actually, the other thing was also quite okay. La. The content was okay. It's just the, the math was a bit too much. Anyway, this is more, more programming oriented. So this is uh, on a different kind of programming. This is about object-oriented programming. <coughs> and uh, it, it actually solves the, some of the classical problems in uh, object-oriented programming called the expression problem. And I'll tell you what is the expression problem and how the this particular method solves it. And this method is very nice because it's very simple. Uh, and that's probably why it won the best paper award in the conference it was given, which is ECOP, the European Conference on Object-Oriented Programming, 2012. Oh yeah, and also I'd like to uh, thank Professor Strom for uh, allowing me to use his slides. This is slides by Professor Strom uh, at the Joy of Coding 2014 conference. Uh, the talk was Who's Afraid of Object Algebras? But essentially also talk about the same paper, but he has really nice slides, so, uh, so I thought I'd just reuse it instead of redoing the work. Uh, this was the original cover slide of the talk. Um, okay, so the idea uh, here in general talking about accessibility, so we're looking at we have some existing module or uh, classes or objects, this is object oriented. Uh, well, this is statically typed right, rather. Object orientation is the feature that we use in this particular solution, but this problem, this expression problem occurs in any uh, statically typed language. So the classic example is you have some, uh, the toy example we have is you have some language with uh, additions and you have some uh, code written for that. And now you want to extend this language with uh, multiplication. And you don't want to change any of your existing code. You just want to write like new code to add in the addition feature and reuse all the existing implementation for the language with addition. How do we do that? Right. So that's the, the question. Uh, so this is what it looks like sort of. So you, like you have the, the syntax like one plus two and then uh, the, the classical way of doing it in object oriented languages is you define uh, you know interface, say uh, expression exp and then you define um, subclasses for each of the parts of the expression. So you have uh, you know, the literal, the one and the two. Uh, we call it class lit, and then you have a, a class represent the, the addition operation, class add. Right? This is a very classical way of uh, doing it. And then you might uh, uh, convert that syntax one plus two into the abstract syntax, uh, which is the new add, parentheses, new literal one, new literal two, and so on. Okay, so this is the, the example problem we will look at. Uh, and generally what we want to do is, there, there are two classes of things. So one, on the left hand side we have the variants, which are the different kinds of um, components of this simple mini language. Right? You have add, literal, and multiplication. And on the other hand you have different operations, which is what you want to do with this structure that you've constructed. So maybe you want to eval, like you want to print out the value, or you want to um, print means you want to like, show the, a string representation of the expression. Like so, just like show the string one plus two instead of show the value three, and you can do many other things. Like you can run a type checker, you can run different things over the uh, tree of expressions, right? So oh, here, so this example of eval, right? So if you run eval over the uh, the tree, you get the the value three. If you run the uh, print operation, you get the the string one plus two, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about okay. Uh, let's talk about this. Uh, Let's talk about this first. <laughs> so, okay, the expression problem was the coined by Philip Wattler in an email to the Haskell mailing list, I think. So, it is a problem with um, statically typed languages. I think dynamic languages have no, have no issues with this. So, the idea is you want to add new cases, which is new variants, like the multiplication. And then uh, you want to also add new um, operations, like maybe, you know, instead of eval, you have print and type check and so on. So, you have these two ways of extending the problem, right? And you want to do that by writing new code without changing existing code. Mm. And then uh, obviously that means without recompiling because you didn't change them. And as well as you still have the static type safety. Right? So all the, all the types uh, uh, work correctly. So this is called the expression problem. Okay, and then, uh, so yeah, you have different languages. And uh, actually the examples language just now was in, shown in Dart. Uh, so in particular for all languages, 
uh, they work very well in adding new variants. So that's what it means here, right? So all languages like um, you know Java, C sharp, and so on work very well adding new variants because they are like new um, like subclass, new implementations of your interface, like your, your new class multiplication, right, and so on. Uh, but they're not so well in adding new uh, operations because you can imagine operations will be like uh, methods in your the, the classes, right, like your add class, your multiplication class. So to do another like operation like um, print, you're going to add a print method to all these um, classes. So that requires, actually you need to change all the, the classes. Yeah, you can power code. Yeah, you can power code. So that's not, that's not, that doesn't solve, yeah. that, doesn't, that doesn't satisfy the expression problem. Uh, the other way around for functional programming languages, like uh, Racket, which is not here, but anyway, so you have Haskell, ML, F sharp, or Camel, and so on. Uh, it's easier to add new functions, like uh, because you usually pattern match over the, the objects and then you can just define new, um, new functions. Like you can define eval function, define a print function, define a, uh, define a type check function or whatever it is. It's easier to add new functions, but harder to add new um, uh, types or variants, right? Because if you add a new variant, you're going to change all your existing functions to have a new case, right? To handle the, the, the new variant. So it seems like there's some um, like trade-offs, like if you use one and the other, right? You can extend in one axis, but not the other. So the, the question is, can we extend in both axes in, in a very simple method? So that's what we're going to do uh, in this particular paper. Okay, uh, which is called object algebra. It, it, uh, it just has a very complicated name, but it's actually a very simple thing. Uh, so you can think of it as a design pattern, you know, a way to structure your classes uh, using something called abstract algebra. I'll explain what it is. And that solves the expression problem. And the interesting bit about this solution, this is not the first solution, um, but it's a solution that uses very little um, advanced features of languages. So you, you'll see as I tell you the solution. OK, uh, yeah. So let's look at, OK, so this, is, this again is the classical example of how you do it in O language, right? You define uh, a class for each of your variants. Uh, so okay, I sort of went through this part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, never mind. Okay, uh, yeah. So, so OO does it the, the horizontal way, right? You define all the variants, but you can't do the other part. And then one way we can also do it with, with the operations, something called the visitor pattern, but I guess I won't dwell too much into that. Not really a crucial part of the paper. Uh, but you can do like the FP style using something called visitor pattern, if you, if you know what that means. If not, um, never mind. You can also do the, F, the, the functional programming style in, in all languages. La with this uh, visitor design pattern. So it has the opposite problem, as I said. It doesn't work well for adding new variants. OK. So let's come to the solution now. So this is the interesting bit. How do we solve it? And what, what is the insight, actually? Uh, and this is the paper, right? Uh, so what is the insight? So again, let's look, back, look, look at the original solution. I mean, the original, the classical way of doing it with OO, right? You have like print and eval methods in your object. Right? And then if you want to do another like, method, like uh, type check, for example, you've got to put another, add a type check method to all your objects. Right? So, um, so it seems like our objects are getting more and more fat. So the, the, the solution turns out to be, let's make custom design objects. So instead of one object with many methods, one method for each of the operations we want to perform, um, we will use uh, sort of custom objects or single purpose objects as it says here on the slide. So for the problem of printing, we will just have uh, one object with the print method. And for the problem of doing eval, we have another object with the eval method. So separate objects instead of mushing it all into one thing. So sort of like a factoring, right? We, we break it into the, the parts. Because actually print and eval are sort of separate. They don't really like, Inter they don't interact with one another, right? They're actually quite independent code. So we should perhaps do them separately instead of mushing them together. If we do that, then it turns out we can actually do it, uh, we can actually solve the expression problem. So let's see how we're going to do that. So as I said, we need, we're going to have um, a different object each time, right? So for print, we have an object that knows how to print. And for eval, we have a different object that knows how to eval. So they're not the same thing. So that means we cannot like, construct the objects uh, directly, like new something. Because then, then that will fix the object, right? So we need to change the object depending on what we want to do. So for that, uh, this is also a somewhat familiar pattern. It's called the 
like a factory pattern, right? An abstract factory pattern in this case, actually, which means um, instead of calling the constructors of the object, we use a, a, a method. So in this case, the lit method returns you the literal object. And the add method returns you the, the, the add node or add object, right? And we just need one more step, which is we, we don't actually know the, the type because the type will be different because in one case, the object can know how to print and in another case, the object knows how to eval, right? So actually, the type is going to be different for the two objects. So we cannot fix the type ahead of time, which is here exp. So we just need to perform one more level of abstraction. We, abst we just generic, we just put the type into the generics. So we just, we don't know what type because we don't know what we're going to do. So we just say it's a type E, some type, which do something, maybe print, maybe eval, maybe type check, whatever. So we have this, uh, now we call it the generic factory because uh, it's a factory that produces something of type E, which we don't know what it is until we need it, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so actually this is all we need, kind of, more or less. Okay, let's see. Uh, so where, where is the link with um, algebra, right? Uh, it turns out way back, uh, in the study of uh, ADTs, abstract data types, uh, in, the, in the sort of more, more formal mathematical study, there's this notion of algebraic specification. This is the thing on top. So uh, an algebraic specification of a data type has things like a signature. It's a little ML-ish, I guess. You have, <laughs> you have the signature, where you have this generic variable E, and then you define the operations and so on. These are the operations of your ADT, I guess, in that, in that particular paper. So if you look at that, that's actually very similar to the uh, the thing below, except the thing below are sort of um, factory methods. Uh, the lit and add returns you objects. They don't actually do anything. They just sort of return you an object that has the method. So, th but that's why they call it uh, object algebras. Okay. So let's actually see an example first. So before we get into the last part, uh, let's hope this doesn't mess up the recording. But anyway, <laughs> so let's see an example of implementing that type. So we could define a type. Uh, okay, here, here the name is a little bit different, but the thing of val as lit in the presentation. So just now you just saw how we define the generic factory, right? But we actually still need to implement it to, to actually write the code that does the plus and eval and so on. So this is how it will look like, right? So you would say uh, it's of some type eval, but the, the type eval means it has a function called eval. That, that, that's really all it means. So the, it's an interface which says that there's one function called eval. And so this is the factory method. So this val here is the factory method, right? It returns a new uh, object of type eval. This is, uh, this is Java. So this is an uh, anonymous inner class, anonymous object that has a single method called eval, which just returns the thing because this is the literal, right? Or the, the value. So the evaluation of the literal is just like the number. And then this is the uh, implementation of the uh, add sort of factory method that returns you an object of type eval, which has this particular implementation, right? So it, evals, it, it evaluates the left-hand side and then the right-hand side and it, and it adds it together. Does that make sense? Yeah. See, simple, right? The code is not complicated, I hope. So you can see what we need here. So we actually need two things. We need, uh, we need generics and we need, uh, later on we'll see actually, well, we need subtyping actually. But here we need, here we're implementing interface, which is also quite a common uh, operation. You can also do this with, um, I guess, C. You don't, you, you don't have interface, it's fine. You can use like an abstract class or something. St still works fine. Okay. So now let's try and do the two ways of adding things. You can add, uh, so one way is to add a new variant, which is, let's say, add a multiplication uh, uh, node in the expression tree. Okay, let's look at, oh, sorry, let me show you the print first. Yeah, so this is how, how print would look like if I want to implement um, uh, the print part of it. So I want to print the value 1 plus 2 right, instead of print the, print, print the number 3. So it's pretty similar except we define an interface called print that basically means it has a function called print. It's pretty straightforward. And then uh, you know you just implement that particular method print inside the in the object that you returned. And same for the um, add. Right? Okay. So ah so here we're, we're going to, here's the, now here's the interesting, here's the extensions, extension bit, right? So far we're just using it to encode the, the standard part of the problem with literals and adds. So now I want to extend it with uh, multiplication. So in, uh, here in object algebra is actually quite easy. So you define a new uh, generic factory, if you recall. This 
expression algebra x is a generic factory. So we extend this, so it means it has all the methods of the earlier factory, which is lit val in, this, in the code is val and add, <coughs> and we extend it with one more method called mal, which represents multiplication. This is adding a variant. This is the left-hand side. Right? So again, mal is like add. It has left-hand side, right-hand side, and then the, the result, which is, again, this unknown x thing. So, okay, so this is fine. And now we need to um, update the two methods, right? We have the eval and print. So how do we do that? So in a quite a similar way, actually. So we just extend the... So we're going to do evaluation of uh, the new language of multiplication, right? The interesting part here, you can reuse all the other things we did in front. We just extend the, the exp eval, which already defined the the methods for val and add, we just need to add in the case for the new variant, which was um, mal. And that's, that's all we need to do, actually. So we didn't have to change any code at all, right? If you notice, we only extended existing classes. So this is particularly more important when you're writing libraries, for example. Because if you're writing all like your own code, then you can just open, break open your class and just change the methods, right? But if this is some library that you're giving people, then it's, it's easier for them to just um, extend it with their own additional things instead of having to edit the, the library code. Okay, so this is eval. I think there's one more example, which is print. So print will sort of the same way. Like, we just write the, the minimum we need to, need, need to do, right? which is just to tell it how to handle the case for mal. Because yep. the adding other cases we extend from um, exp print. Right? So that's pretty much it, actually. <laughs> Let's say this is simple. It's it's not supposed to be complicated. Okay, so we we'll talk about this. Yep. So to uh, the syntax here is a bit different, but this is because this is Dart. But it sh this shows that it also works in Dart. So not just in Java, it works in in Dart, and probably in uh, C sharp and a bunch of other things. Because it doesn't use anything at all, right? It uses only generics and um, subtyping. So subtyping most languages have. Most object-oriented languages have subtyping. Uh, most modern languages have generics, like even though Java retrofitted generics in like after 1.5 or something. So, yeah, this is like a recap. So object algebras, what are object algebras? Um, so we defined a, a generic factory interface, and then to um, define the implementations of the various operations, we create the implementation of that factory, like the exp uh, alg. So to add new variants, we extend the interface of the factory, right? Like so, we can extend it with the mal operation. I mean, just define what it means, right? Mal x L L H S right R H S, and to implement it, we just uh, we can implement the interface, but we can reuse the previous implementation by extending by extending it by by uh, inheritance. So this is implementation inheritance. Uh, this is sort of a diagram that shows you the relationship between all the various uh, classes. So the left-hand side, you see the two um, algebras. ALG is algebra. So the top, we have the expression algebra. So with only the value and add. Then the, the multiplication algebra is, uh, is like a subtype, I guess. It's an implementation. It's an extension. It extends. The, 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 the hollow arrow is extends. Right? And the dotted arrow is um, like implements. Right, so we have two different operations, print and eval, that implements the algebra. And then you have the, so when we add the new type, we can um, create the two new print mal and eval mal by um, subtyping from the earlier in implementation. So we don't have to write any additional, like repeat any code. Okay. Uh, and sort of this is a, rearranged version of the diagram. So here on the, on the vertical axis, you have the different variants. La. So the variants means we add new, um, uh, new type of node operations. You can just easily add more like, just by defining um, more of these um, concrete factories right, that creates the, the objects. So the special thing, if you remember, again, the key trick is that we create the object on the fly as we need. Right? So we create the object with just the um, method that we want. So if you want to do print, we create an object with just the print method. If you want to do eval, we create an object with just the eval method. So this scales because then you can have objects with different kinds of methods. Yeah. Okay, and in summary, uh, this is a very simple solution to the 
expression problem. So earlier solutions actually require other things like um, bounds on generic. So some languages support bounds. You can have upper and lower bounds on your generic parameter. Um, Java supports, I think you can say, E extends some type T, or E is a super of some type T, so that uh, is a little bit more complicated. The other features that some other solutions use is wildcards. So you, have, you can have things like question mark uh, in, in the type, you can, like any type in the generic. Uh, that's also a little bit more difficult to use. So this particular solution doesn't have any of these features. It uses a concrete type. So we always say uh, it's an it's a expression algebra of type E or X. Right? We don't have to say E extends some other thing or using more complicated uh, type features. We just need, we need just simple generics uh, is good enough. Yeah, for, for any generics in, uh, as in like templates in C++ is good enough actually for this purpose. Because C++ doesn't yet support the idea of uh, bounds, right? Which it may, I think, uh, in later versions. Uh, okay, and so we should use object algebra because we solve the expression problem. Okay, that's all. Yes, question? So there's a problem. Yeah? What happens when you extend it in parallel Mm -hmm. And then you try to join them in. Then you need multiple inheritance. Ah, good question. What, what do you mean by, mean by join them in? Let's say, say, let's say you start with the add, right? Yeah. So you, you have a mouth that extends from add. Yes. And then let's say you have another one, division, that also extends from add instead of extend from mouth. And then now you want, uh, you want something that supports both mouth and division. Ah, okay. So let me see. They are, they are, they, they have a, it's like a diamond, the, the diamond inheritance code. So there's, there's, another, there's another example actually in the paper they discuss this. Uh, they didn't discuss this in the talk. Um, another way they, they discuss it in the paper is like this. So let, maybe a, a more, because that's a, bit, a little bit weird example. So another example, maybe you have, a, you have like integer expressions and you have Boolean expressions. They're sort of different realms. Right? Boolean will have like n and different operations, right? And then, then you want to combine the two uh, algebras to have a language that have both integers and booleans, for example. Yeah. So that may be a more, uh, slightly more realistic scenario. So how would you do that? So in particular in Java, you can't really do it without rewriting code because you cannot have, uh, there's no multiple inheritance, so to speak. Uh, because j I mean, in Java specifically, it's a thing. So for that, you can actually solve it with languages with traits or mixins. Like Scala and maybe maybe Dart, I don't know. But anyway, uh, so not specifically in Scala. In Java, you cannot you cannot solve that particular uh, case. So you could do it with composition as you as you normally would. So you can you can have a you can have an int bool language, uh, int bool algebra. And, and in Java, I guess you would have to have two lo like local variables. Like do it with composition. I think that's the, the, the cleanest way, right? So you have internally as two. Uh, local factories. One is the int algebra factory. One is the bool algebra factory. And then for each of the methods, it will sort of delegate to the appropriate uh, internal factory. So you get an int bool factory. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, you have to sort of rewrite the the methods to delegate because there's no way to delegate automatically, right? But some languages say you can say these methods will use this like object. This, this yeah, it's, these are like members, right? So you have members of this uh, the, this. Uh, int bool factory, then you can just use it. But in Java, I guess you have to say like, you have to say explicitly, la, because there's no sort of delegation feature. Yeah. But you can still combine, actually. Yeah, yeah. probably need some for composition. Yeah, yeah, you need but to I, I delegate. Think, I think in practice, this could come out uh, a lot more often, because new features can be added uh, in parallel. Mm. People mm -hmm. can de develop different kind of language features separately, and then they yeah. want to join back. So Yes. So if you use inheritance, they could have like multiple branches. And yeah, join it's true. Inheritance here mainly is for the purpose of reusing the, the code. So if you have language with delegates, you could technically also use delegation. Yeah, you don't have to use inheritance. It's just in, in the examples here in Java, we, we can only use inheritance if we don't want to rewrite the, the methods. Yeah. Other questions? It's, it's interesting because yes. when you're working, you... you you end up coming coming up with like half baked solution of something similar, but uh -huh. because the problem was never formalized, like in my mind, I, okay. I never knew this was what I was struggling. It's like, okay. yeah, but I want to do this, but I want to do this. Ah, right. this is annoying. And then you come up with some strange solution for it. Now you realize actually, 
this would have been a much nicer and cleaner fit if they had known about this problem and this solution. This is quite quite a bit of a leap of insight in the sense that you cannot bake your objects in, you cannot like new like construct the objects. Correct. You have to use another function to construct it. So there's this additional level of indirection. Like here we have to call all these methods. So for example, if you're really writing a language, your parser will have to take in as input the the factory object and use that to instantiate the yeah. stamp out the nodes. Yeah. But then the nodes can only do one thing. So if you need another kind of node, you have to put it into the parser again to stamp create a different tree. So these examples are for like like uh, trees and stuff. It doesn't have to be. It's really anything where you have variants and operations. It doesn't have to be like language trees or whatever. It's just that this happened to be the the example from uh, the expression problem yeah. paper. Yeah. Yeah. In the functional languages, I think there's also another solution is which is open sum type. I think it's mm. camel where you can have an open ended sum type that you add new variants later on. Ah yes, that that's also possible. Open classes la, in general. There's some there's some languages with open classes. So I think that's similar, right? Where you can yeah. add add variants to the sum type. Yeah, that's true. I guess here they're talking about the fact that if you, for in that case, yeah, is the type is still the there's still only one type, right? I guess like when you extend the type, does it become like a separate type or is it still the same type? It's still the same type. Uh. It, it's a bit like it, it becomes a bit like object oriented because mm -hmm. because then you you can you you have a, a default case for right. handling unknown type, unknown mm -hmm. unknown unknown variants. Okay. So so then when every time you measure. Measure, measure the variant value you have to always have a, a default case. A default case, okay. Yeah, yeah, that could work too, actually. Yeah. It's just that that feature is probably not available in most of the languages. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll have it. yeah. Another, another new language features probably can help is also like low polymorphism. Hmm, yes. Yes, you can define your records and yeah. then you add in a new record and then you can also combine, combine this kind of. Uh, Records of factory functions. Yeah. No, I mean this is not the only solution, as I said. So I mean I think that the fact about this one is that it's just, it's it's simple enough that it works in most like existing languages, mainstream languages. It doesn't need any language changes. So <laughs> that, that that's the beauty of this particular solution, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Next meetup in a month. <laughs> if we have people, <laughs> thanks for both of you for doing necromancy and reviving the meetup. Hopefully, <laughs> we'll have more people next next month. Yeah. Maybe find some. Uh, and you can always know. blame me for being the lazy person to not bother, you know, uh, advertising this one too much. So <laughs> my fault. Isn't there a big like internet meeting? Yeah. The yes. Idea. Yeah. Maybe you can find someone yeah, to present. Yeah. Meet up there. Yeah. <laughs> can maybe. But that one is like second week. Uh, Sorry, there's some, there's some interesting people who want to talk. We can, we can work stuff out for this. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if people think that preparing a talk is a big hassle. That's kind of a cheap trick if you notice that I've been using. <laughs> you don't use your own slides. Yeah. Yeah. You find someone who's given a really good talk yeah. and you ask them for, to use their slides. Yeah. Usually then yeah. that kind of gives you like 90% of the way. Yeah. They just yeah. need to do 10%. Yeah. That's usually quite doable actually. Yeah. The hard part is finding good slides. <laughs> it's very hard to find good slides. Yeah. Still doesn't solve the problem. It's still back <laughs> in the same thing. Lots of points. But that I mean, at least that's a you know like a option. Like, there's a there's a sort of a cheap way out. It still depends on your topic. Yeah. Nobody else has found your topic. No, but it's a paper. You usually need somebody presented it oh. the first time. No lah, oh. papers a bit. Yeah, defense, defense, defense. defense. Yeah. But likely lah, because generally people will write a paper, then talk about it some at a conference, something similar, or whatever. So yeah, a lot of the conference things are now on like yeah. online or yeah. whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, now, people put slides. yeah now it's yeah, very good actually. Yeah, my PhD is very advanced. Yeah, my PhD has never put slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brian's PhD yeah. secret. <laughs> Nobody knows ever. Yeah, yeah, I have a PhD defense somewhere. I'm sure. <laughs> Looking <laughs> around on the interwebs. No, yeah. definitely not on the interwebs. They now have video, now they have slides, yeah. whatever. So many things, gems in the internet. Uh, That's what it is. So many gems. Nice stuff. Oh, yes. Michael, okay. And I give them.
Oh yeah. Plum, plum, plum. <laughs> commit, 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 commit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, See, it's like Michael Ching is more, you know.